Hello and welcome to New Chips Online Demo Week. My name is Armando Vera Carvajal and I'm the Accelerator Director here at New Chip. Uh, we are pleased that you are tuned into this week-long online event that welcomes hundreds of New Chip startups alongside thousands of investors and entrepreneurs from around the world. Uh, today we are joined by Will O'Brien, an entrepreneur and investor in Silicon Valley with expertise in blockchain, data and analytics, fintech and gaming, for conversation on his journey as an entrepreneur, startup investor, and an innovator. Now, for some context, as a seasoned technology executive, uh, Will holds a proven track record, uh, track record for scaling organizations, managing corporate financings, and also structuring strategic partnerships. Notably, he's been part of two, two unicorns. Uh, the first was Big Fish Games, a casual uh, gaming publisher where Will was Senior Vice President of Corporate and Business Development from 2010 to 2013. The second was BitGo, a leading cryptocurrency security and custody company. Um, Will was co-founder and CEO from 2013 to 2015, and BitGo was acquired last week for $1.2 billion. Uh, Will is also an active investor and advisor to nearly 70 early stage startups uh, and blockchain projects in the US, Europe, and in South Korea. Uh, he's also an LP and an advisor in blockchain capital uh, and an advisor to other venture firms, including, including uh, Fabric.bc, Gravity Group, and HUD Capital. Uh, most recently, Will is a co-founder and CEO of a new venture called NFT Oasis. Uh, which has launched an immersive VR experience for the NFT community. Uh, Will also holds a, a BA in computer science from Harvard University and an MBA from MIT Sloan School of Management. Will, thank you so much for joining us today here at UCHIP's Online Demo Week. Uh, I can imagine you're incredibly busy, but it's such a pleasure to have you here as our guest. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Armando. Excellent. So to kick off the conversation, I... I'd love to talk about your entrepreneurial path and, and learn about what it's been like. You know, going back a few years in time, what inspired you to pursue the entrepreneurial path in the first place? Well, I think a lot of people will tell a story of when they were a kid creating a lawn mowing business or a car wash. Or, and and that, that's true. I, I had started trying to find ways to make money and, and the internet was just coming online when I was teenager I started trying to figure out ways to to do something with that but you know it was it was really actually having the experience of having been a technologist uh, studying computer science at Harvard and then spending the first part of my career in fintech where I was doing amazing projects I was building real-time trading systems for the banks and the buy side and when my company sold to Accenture in 2006 I I, you know, we sold the company and I made something like $15,000 in stock options. And it was that moment I said, well, what the heck is a cap table? Never heard of that before. And so I, I then applied to MIT Business School, MIT Sloan, and went to business school with the intention of figuring out where my blind spots were. And to come out of school at graduation as an entrepreneur with the skills and the network and, and the ideas to do that. So in 2008, I started building businesses um, and started looking at businesses in consumer internet, payments. Uh, I found my way towards social games and the gaming revolution in, in that period of time, right after Facebook launched its platform. And it, it, I found that building companies and building products was a very creative pursuit. Um, I'm also a musician, um, always been a very creative and, you know, a lot of creative hobbies. I, I'm an improvisational piano player. I you know, love thinking about things in systems thinking, very abstract fashion. And, and so the opportunity to apply my, my technical skills with that kind of creativity in entrepreneurship was kind of an instant hit for me and something that I really wanted to pursue. So over the course of my career from, from then on, I started building first within companies, new businesses, and trying to pioneer innovation from within, and then, and then ultimately took on uh, the CEO role and new you know, startup role and co-founder role and several times, which several of them have been very good success. And so I'd like to pay that back now a lot with you know, mentoring and angel investing and advising young startups and uh, people who have passion for the problem of what they're trying to solve 
and maybe could use a little help on to get through the uh, the venture system, the go to market, and and ultimately how to make your company successful. That's incredible, and um, you know, just a tremendous trajectory that you've had from from an earlier age up until now. And it's surprising that you still have enough time for for all these awesome hobbies, which I'm very interested in. Um, you know, going back to some of those earliest uh, ventures, like the one you mentioned with Accenture that you sold, what were some of the biggest misconceptions that you had about entre- entrepreneurship back in those days? Well, I think that um, business school is kind of a, kind of a, it's a great place to be around other people with great ideas, but, you know, the true learning is it's a little business school can guide you down a path. that's a little bit too naturally academic or formulaic. Um, You know, so, so can, you know, accelerators or incubators. If, if, if you're being directed down a path that you create these slides in this pitch deck, or you create, you know, this particular sales motion, and then therefore you're going to be the next Dropbox or the next Facebook uh, it's a little misgiving. So I do think that there is a lot of, um, benefit from taking that learning and taking that, that structure and, the, and the, the opportunity to be mentored by people who've been there and taking that, that structure of how to think about building out your business, but then really going and talking with customers and, and doing customer development and, and, and building your business in an iterative fashion. I have, a, I have a rule I use sometimes, the rule of five. Can you find five customers or five examples? Can you find 50? Can you find 500? And each time that you level that up, there should be more of a homogeneity, more of a consistency, repeatability in what you do. The first time you're looking for customers, you've got a new product and you might find eight different use cases or eight different examples. But if you're going to try to then build 80 different ones, your cost is going to be upside down and you're not going to be able to really build a, a growth business. So I think that's one of the that's one of the things that comes from experience or comes from bringing people with experience into your company. And that wasn't something I knew when I first started a business. My first true tech startup was in 2008, graduating from business school. And I was offered an opportunity as an EIR at Highland Capital in in Silicon Valley. And I was building a consumer internet business. I launched a TechCrunch 50. And the next week, uh, Lehman Brothers went under and the financial crisis took hold. So no one wanted to invest in a first time founder into the financial crisis. And all of my ideas that were on paper or in my head, um, because I hadn't quite yet really done the customer development and really proven out that repeatability in that market, in that financing market, it was that much more difficult. So in that case, I made the decision to figure out a way to package up the technology I built, which was good, and sell that so I could move on to other ventures. Um, So now when I build companies or now when I invest in companies, I'm looking for more than just wouldn't it be great if something could be, but seeing people who can actually prove that it is great for the customer. It's so cheap now to build a website, to build an e-commerce system, to build a mobile app. I mean, it is so cheap compared to 10 years ago, compared to 25 years ago, that you should be able to prove some repeatability and consistency in your initial business. Right, and especially to drive scale, at the kind of scale that investors want to see. Um, you know, Pivoting this a little bit to, to your experience as an investor, right? On top of all, your, all of your direct startup experience, you're also an active investor and an advisor to uh, over 70 early stage startups. It's a big commitment, right? So tying that to what you just mentioned, what do you look for in a startup when, when you're evaluating a potential investment? And you know, that could be at the earliest stage of it. Uh, fundamentally, I usually ask two questions. One is, what is your origin story? And two is what is what does this look like when you have achieved scale? And I ask these questions uh, in that kind of abstract fashion on purpose because it the way that somebody anchors their response really tells me a lot about what they care about, what they think about, their framing. So the origin story question is really like, have you been in the trenches and experienced the pain? Right? If you if you're building a business in fashion and you've never like even done anything in fashion, then that's one of those, wouldn't it be great if concepts, or if you're, if you're trying to uh, disrupt the music industry, uh, blockchain or something, and you have no idea how the power dynamics work within the, within the music industry, it's never going to get started. So what was the pain that you experienced 
And did you start solving that pain on your own uh, and realize that this could scale, right? Uh, example, eBay, right? Pierre Omidar started eBay as an auction site on the side while he was working somewhere. And it wasn't until it was like really humming that he left, raised $11 million and never spent a dime. And it became, you know, obviously a massive company. So the origin story is important to me to, to understand whether people have really gotten to the point of clarity about the problem and uh, even before the solution. And then the, the question about what does this look like for you when you've achieved scale? Um, I like to see what people answer to see what they think scale is. Do they see it as market share? Do they see it as revenue, profit? Do they see it as um, you know, a, a, a competitive uh, ocean of, of, of other businesses or do they see this as blue ocean? Do they see this as you know, an abundant model that's connecting other partners and other ecosystems? Or is it a winner take all? Um, and do they think of scale like a billion dollars in market, a billion dollars in revenue or much bigger? So, you know, you, you, I think, you know, when I, when I angel invest uh, or advise, that's my first filter on whether people can under, you know, really jump out. And then after that, I do look for a partnership. I look for um, product oriented, technological oriented entrepreneurs who probably just have some blind spots around, well, how do I, how do I raise money, right? How do I go to market? How do I deal with the press? Uh, what happens when somebody comes and asks, you know, they want to meet with me about M&A? What do I do then? Those kind of, those kind of inflection points in the company, uh, I'm, I've been very good at and I've had a lot of experience in. And when an entrepreneur that I am working with texts me or calls me and says, I'm about to go into this meeting or here I got this problem or I want to go meet, find somebody at Apple or Google, you know, in like one text message or email or phone call, I can typically help them accelerate six to 12 months that they would otherwise be trying to figure out that path. So, and that makes me really happy to see good ideas and good people move faster towards innovation. That's really fascinating. And I want to say that's the ideal type of investor that, that entrepreneurs should be seeking, right? One that actually brings that partnership and that perspective to the relationship, because at the end of the day, a startup investing is a long-term play, right? It's not a get in, get out next week. It's a, we're here for the next five, seven, 10 years. And you need that true partner who, who's in it to help you through it all. Um, what's your perspective on, on the most common mistake that entrepreneurs make when they're fundraising? Uh, well, let's see. Um, I touched a little bit on, you know, following somebody else's charted course, right? I think that's, that's dangerous. I think when it comes to you know, venture and, and, and um, you know, pitching venture, I think if done poorly, it can be a very long road that exhausts the founders and the companies because venture capitalists have the, the luxury to kind of slow play it and wait. Um, and so I think it's very important to always create urgency and create a clock for a fundraising cycle. I mean, I often tell mm -hmm. startups to say, pick a date, like we're closing this round on July 1st. I just keep saying that. It's a classic, like, it's a classic sales technique, you know, it's just keep driving everybody towards this date. And instead of asking for a uh, startup for investors to invest, go meet with them and tell them what you're doing. Have an informational meeting first, um, get them excited, get them to see you as an expert in the domain that they want to learn more about. If you're the absolute expert in NFTs or AI for pharmaceuticals, well, share that with them. You're not giving away your company by sharing your information. You're building up your personal brand. Augment that with some published thought leadership, right? Bring great people around the table and then ask this question to investors. Say, we're closing on July 1st, thereabouts. We're raising something. We haven't determined exactly what we're raising yet, but we're looking at this round. Do you have the capacity to work with me on this round, to work with me on this opportunity? And get the, get the investors to be kind of on your same side, almost like, you know, as if they were already on your board and, and see which investors respond well to that. Because there are investors who will say, well, this is our process, talk to my junior associate. And then there are investors who will really like to see, to get to work with somebody who's brilliant, you know, and, and, and won't be predatory in their approach. So I think that maybe the summation of that is just to try to build those personal connections and then by the time you ask for the money, you've already built that rapport and that foundation. And now you can get to terms. 
Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree. That's something that we really drive here at Nietzsche. Always ask for advice. Don't ask for money, right? Those who ask for money get advice. Those who ask for advice end up getting money. Uh, so very, <laughs> very much in line with that. Staying on the subject of, of investment, um, pivoting a little bit away from early stage fundraising and investment, a little bit to more the exit side of things. You were recently a director uh, on the board of the NetFin Acquisition Corporation, which is a SPAC uh, focused on targeting fintech businesses. SPAC, you know, that's a, that's a four letter word that has become all the hype this year in 2021, uh, not just across the investment uh, ecosystem, but also the startup world. Uh, and it also brings about some ideas for the regulatory bureaus as they start to, to grapple with it. Um, we've all heard of them. Many people understand them. Some sort of get what they do, but some people do, they just don't know what a SPAC is. So in layman's terms, can you explain to you know, the entrepreneurial audience what are SPACs and why do they seem to matter so much right now? Right. As SPAC, it's also referenced as a blank check, blank check company. Uh, and what it is, it, it's a public vehicle. In our case, we did an IPO about 253 million on NASDAQ. So it's publicly listed on NASDAQ. And then the company that raises that capital has about 18 months to close a business transaction. In the earlier stage, some people have referred to this as a search fund with private equity, but this is a public equity instrument. And the institutions that invest in this, the investors that invest in this have the option to go through with the acquisition when presented or the option to take their money back. So it's a very, it's a low risk, no risk to the institutional investors. The, the, the team that puts this back together has a, basically a blank check to go find a company of a certain profile and present a business case for making an acquisition. So they've become popular because they've, they're really an interesting vehicle to, to fit kind of a wedge in, a, in the market that's been missing. Uh, so you think about the life cycle of investment from seed financing all the way through IPO. The IPO window has gotten a lot longer because of Sarbanes-Oxley and because both venture investors and entrepreneurs just want to stay private. There's not a lot of incentive to go public if you don't have to. They're forcing functions to go public, but a lot of it's, you know, there was the heyday of IPOs. And then recently, you know, founders and, and management teams and investors would kind of rather stay private unless they can go public. Uh, easily, you know, effectively and get good liquidity. So you now you've had kind of growth funds, right? The series G's and everybody else. And then you have these IPOs where companies are getting bigger and bigger and bigger at IPO. Um, just look at, you know, some of our recent IPOs, you know, Coinbase is $100 billion, right? A direct sale IPO, thereabouts. So the SPAC is an opportunity for management companies and management teams and, you know, companies and investors to get liquidity by going into the public markets, but the entree of the public markets is done through this vehicle. So the SPAC will take out kind of like an MBO or it used to be or an LBO, will take out that team and provide liquidity. Um, and it's it's been interesting because you have this kind of, this cohort of companies that are actually pretty good EBITDA, you know, pretty good profile to be a public company, but haven't wanted to go down that path. The SPAC is kind of fitting that market gap um, and that's why it's become popular. It's become controversial because there's been a bunch of SPACs that have not done well or have been you know, a little bit um, suspect, but I think there are a lot of good examples out there. And I think the model in the US and Canada is gonna stay for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, totally agree. And so do you think that um, as some of the later stage startups achieve you know, stronger performance and like you mentioned, just more streamlined EBITDA, does, you think like SPACs will become more of the, the default uh, liquidation option, or do you think they're still going to pursue IPOs, or are, are IPOs sort of falling out of fashion in a longer term trend? I think we'll have all of the above. I, the 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 uh, having been through cycles where you know company where we're looking at an IPO, ultimately do a trade sale. Um, you know nowadays you have SPAC as an option. You're really feeling out the market, right? You can have growth capital, direct sale, I, SPAC, or um, uh, excuse me, or uh, IPO. And a lot of times because, you know, the IPO cycle, you think about the roadshow, you know, creating the S1, all the, all the things you have to do leading up to an IPO, plus once you're a public, all the things you have to do operationally, um, that's a lot of work. And if you're in a market, for example, let's say the gaming market that goes through, you know, fluctuations, ebbs and flows, 
and you're doing all the work to prepare for an IPO and then the IPO market falls out or like a few years ago, the SaaS market, all the multiples came crashing down. Well, you don't really want to like do continue to do all that work and then have a bad app, a bad coming out in, in the IPO. So that's where SPAC is an option and, and obviously otherwise trade sell growth capital is an option. I think in all cases, once you get to a company, uh, a scale of a company, you want to be hitting the performance metrics, right? You want to be, you want to be throwing off EBITDA. You want to be looking at ways you can use m and uh, to, to consolidate the market and to become a market leader. Um, and the public currency gives you a lot of opportunity for that. If you're one of the earlier within a market to have a public currency, you can start buying up other, other players in your market. That's a great strategic move. And so if a SPAC gives you the opportunity to do that in a couple of months rather than nine months, that's interesting. Um, but a, a leader like Coinbase or Facebook or Google, I mean, they're going to go public because they are the leader, right? That's still advantageous to them. Right, right. Tying this sort of just to, to the general concept of exits for startups um, and you having been a part of many exits yourself, what do you think most startup founders get wrong about startup exits? Sell too early or way too late is one issue, right? Um, it's, uh, I, I think, you know, the Google founders uh, almost sold Google to Yahoo for $2 million, Right. And then because they didn't know what to do. And then Mike Moritz from Sequoia came in and said, I'll give you two million dollars in venture funding instead or four or six million dollars. Just go build the company. So, you know, there's every company goes through these these troughs of just difficult times. There's a lot of mental health, a lot of stress on families. And so selling too early, if you really have a big tailwind behind you in the market and you really have something that is durable, that can be a mistake. But waiting too late can also be a mistake. You know, I tell a lot of my entrepreneurs that I work with that you're not the CEO of this company. You are a serial entrepreneur. This one may succeed or fail, uh, but you are learning all the way and you are continuing to build. And so don't look at each company as a the end-all be-all transaction. You know, in, in my case, I've continued to grow my career and now have many different projects and companies that I'm involved in. And I'm founder CEO of a new company that I launched this year and, you know, sold other companies last year. This is all part of being, uh, having a network effect around myself, having a lot of experience. Um, I could, I could look at peers of mine that I graduated business school with that are still at or running the same company uh, 13 years later. So, you know, that's good for them if that's their choice, but it doesn't, it doesn't you can be, Zero entrepreneur, even with failures, and you can when you hit it out of the park, you're gonna you're gonna know the timing's right. So I think exits um, uh, should be timed right, and also should not be so much of a distraction. Right? Like it's it's alluring to go take a meeting with Google's M and A team when you have you know seven hundred fifty thousand dollars in revenue and no profit, and you know, but they're looking at you as an aqua hire. They're not looking at you as buying you for three hundred million dollars. So be mindful of what kind of distraction it can be to take these meetings and approach it instead through partnership or through information or something like that. Like don't take the meeting with the M&A guy, take the meeting with the head of the products, right. Or the head of the business, because ultimately they're going to be the person that's going to decide and motivate the price for you. The M&A team is going to come in and do that transaction. So I think more entrepreneurs can get savvy with who and who to talk to and when it'll it'll uh, reduce a lot of churn inside their team, mental churn. Yeah, I mean, that's really, really good insight. And I totally agree. I think uh, it's all about the right timing, right? And the right, the right exit to, to get the best outcome, but also linking it to what you mentioned, uh, entrepreneurship, if you're a true entrepreneur, you'll be doing this many times over. And if one fails, you move on to the next one. If one succeeds, you move on to the next one, hopefully. And, and that's a very compelling path. Um, Pivoting away from sort of the, the startup scene and just general investing, uh, you are a recognized uh, thought leader and trailblazer in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space. Uh, you were previously the co-founder and CEO of BitGo, which I mentioned is a leading Bitcoin security firm. Uh, you're also recognized as a thought leader in the blockchain industry, and you've helped uh, to grow positive awareness of crypt crypto through public speaking, partnerships with incumbents and also policy work. Um, there's obviously been a lot of movement and talk about crypto, Bitcoin, et cetera. 
over the past year and especially this year, right? With some indication of institutional movement into this space, um, you know, in, in light of some of the recent hype, right? And, and growth that we've seen for a lot of the, the cryptocurrencies and blockchains, especially Elon Musk making all these comments about pulling out of Tesla, uh, Bitcoin out of Tesla. You know, what are your thoughts on what's currently go going on and where we're headed? Well, I found, I found Bitcoin in 2012. I read the white paper and immediately saw that this is uh, the biggest opportunity in mankind for financial freedom, financial inclusion, and a rebuild of the entire financial ecosystem. And so now when you say, you know, financial institutions are taking note, um, that is, you know, that's uh, <laughs> what nine years later from my reading, 13 years from Satoshi's white paper, and many decades of other people trying to get towards this cryptographic cryptography uh, norm. So it's, it's been an interesting ride to see. I think there was a quote by Gandhi, like first they laugh at you, then they, um, you know, then they try to destroy you. And then eventually they, they follow you or accept you. I just butchered that quote, but, but the point being, I went through a lot of the mockery, you know, phase. I was talking to a lot of these institutions back then, and they just said, we're, you know, we don't take this seriously. Um, you had people like Jamie Dimon outwardly saying he'll fire anybody at JP Morgan that is doing anything in Bitcoin. Meanwhile, they had a, a prop desk in, Bitcoin, in crypto trading that they didn't tell anybody about. So, it, you know, there's there's it, it's it's funny the attention being paid to the cult of personality right now with the meme coins and whatever institutions are doing. Because this entire Bitcoin concept was to move away from that. It was to give the power to the people, is to decentralize um, decision making, is to be able to not have third party decision makers and, and counterparties and middlemen. So I, I think it's natural that people are seeing the growth in value and trying to get their piece of the pie or claim their stake. Um, but the long arc towards decentralization which is passion for me and something I worked on a lot and something I, you know, I, I'm an LP in blockchain capital. They've you know, invested in a hundred something companies that are leaders in this decentralized finance movement. It's very important that we always remember that that's the purpose. It's not just to give Wall Street a better database. That's not the purpose of blockchain. And so I've, you know, I've gone around the world, South Korea um, and, you know, Europe and the U.S. looking for, uh, king potential kings in a category, so I, I think the 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 hype, the the Doge, the Shiba Inu, all these kind of things are are honestly it's like going to the roulette table and just putting it down on six or eleven or whatever you want to pick because it, it is not fundamentally necessary nor a value. Whether Tesla accepts Bitcoin or doesn't for cars doesn't have any impact on the value of the underlying of Bitcoin. It just has an impact on people who uh, are of the cult of Elon and decide, and think that whatever he's going to do moves the market and the people who trade on memes and, and, and personalities, because it's true. People do follow in or out of trades because they read about something. So we're at an interesting point, I say, with a lot of noise to signal right now that there is foundational technology that's been built that will continue to be amazing and will emerge. And these hype cycles will come and go been through seven of them, I think, since 2012 myself. Uh, I remember when Bitcoin reached $200 and crashed down to 60, and then it reached <laughs> 1100 and crashed down to 200. So um, been through a few of these. Uh, I would say my advice is if, if you're looking to get into blockchain, like get yourself inside the community, you know, and it, I'm not talking about day trading. I mean, like actually building solutions. Go find, there's some great companies to work for right now, um, great opportunities. Um, but Bitcoin is here to say, I said in 2013 that Bitcoin would be the global reserve currency within 20 years. And it's tracking pretty well towards that. Um, and I think Ethereum and, and a lot of other technologies that have been built are providing us opportunity for new models. Um, I think the NFT uh, movement is very powerful as a way to give artists and musicians and creators an opportunity to own their own audience and to, and to build, build on, you know, reclaim their value in society. So for me, it's all tracking well, but you're right. It does, it does come and go pretty hot, you know, but uh, it's, it's, it's fun. It's exciting. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very exciting. And I, I'm on that same page with you. I, 
I believe more in the technology itself, the blockchain, the, the long-term play, if you will, not the sort of short-term technical candlestick market swings, which can be just utterly irrational. Um, you mentioned NFTs, and I, I would love to sort of pivot a little bit in that direction. You know, NFTs are not necessarily a new technology. They've been around for quite a while. Uh, there's been a lot of excitement around NFTs as of the past few months. Uh, you are the founder of NFT Oasis, and you're very passionate about this space. So I would love to hear your thoughts and perspectives on NFTs. You know, what are they? Because a lot of people still can't grasp the concept. I've talked to investors who still don't know what an NFT is. So would love to hear from your perspective. What do you? What are they? How do they work? Why do they exist? So well, an NFT stands for non fungible token. Uh, so if we think of a, a dollar is fungible with every other dollar. A Bitcoin is fungible with every other Bitcoin. Uh, but a piece of art is not fungible. Uh, if you made a, a copy of that, a JPEG of that, that's the same as every other copy, but that's not the original. Um, the original has this uh, word provenance. Where did it come from? And then the chain of custody of that original is what determines the value at auction or in collector's minds. And that's the physical world we've been living in in the art world for a while. How do you know what's real or what's a fake? Same thing with luxury goods, sh sneak shoes, purses, you know, bags, et cetera. So items that are supposed to be one of a kind or one of a few um, and that are susceptible to fraud, uh, then that, makes it, that creates a problem for the market. So think of it just the way that Bitcoin kind of digitized currency, NFTs are digitizing art, music and, and other forms, fashion, athletics, lots of other things that represent the brand of the creator. Uh, and if, if you are the holder of an NFT because you're using your you know, Ethereum wallet to buy an NFT on one of these marketplaces, you can now cryptographically prove that you bought it and you own it. And when you go sell it, the smart contract that's in there, it can be predetermined how much to give back to the original creator, how much to give to other parties. So NFT ecosystem that's emerging is gonna allow creators to establish the provenance, the authenticity of their work up front. And as it passes through and gets sold through the market and gets used through the market, all the economic activity on top of that art, on top of that creation can be appropriately distributed. So what's this mean? This means that we're gonna to start to see massive tectonic shifts in, in the ecosystem. The, the, the predatory uh, models that Artists have experienced for decades with music labels, you know, auction houses, middlemen, all sorts of things where, where artists, you know, they move to streaming and they can't make any money on streaming. They move, creators move to YouTube, can't make money on YouTube. All of these systems are going to get ripped apart in a very substantial way. And so that's why I'm passionate about it because I'm personally a musician. I, I released my, my first solo improvisational jazz album or pian improvisational piano album in January. Um, I write music every day. I, um, I, I support, you know, Burning Man, the arts. Um, and I, I really want to, like, at this stage of my career, be working on something that benefits the world. And I think when we look at where we are after this last year, last several years of the social dilemma, last year in quarantine, there's this toxicity in the human spirit, right? And how do we get out of that? It's the artists and musicians that bring us through. So it's time to compensate those artists and musicians. It's time to forward invest in a new renaissance that we want to see. And the NFT movement in combination with other effects like the clubhouse effect that's breaking down walls of communication is now giving us an opportunity to like reshuffle the deck and build the future we want to live in. Yeah, that, that's powerful. And I, um, I, I also paint, I've been painting for a lot of years so I can relate to sort of the, the need, right? To heal the world through all this tension with the creative arts. Um, now, uh, I'd love to get your perspective uh, from NFT Oasis, right? You've launched this new startup. You know, what are you doing with it? Where is it now? Where is it headed? Right. So I'm the co-founder and CEO of NFT Oasis. And it is a, uh, we're using VR as a new opportunity for artists and musicians to have a stage to showcase what they're doing as they embrace this NFT movement and bringing life to this movement. I. I'd like to roll a, a brief video now that'll show off the NFT Oasis. Yeah, absolutely. Let's watch it. Welcome to the NFT Oasis. The Oasis is a virtual environment 
designed for the NFT community. A utopian vision that brings the revolutionary power of the NFT movement to life in fully immersive VR. Art is meant to bring us together from anywhere in the world. So we've built a bridge to the metaverse where you can gather with your friends to experience art, music, and custom VR environments together on whatever device you're using. Creators can hold gallery exhibitions and panels. Musicians and brands can build custom VR experiences. Collectors can have their own custom galleries to display their art and hold private events. Everything that happens in the NFT Oasis can be streamed to social media platforms as exciting new marketing assets. As the metaverse expands and a decentralized gig economy emerges, users will also be able to purchase digital real estate within the world. We're building on the economics of abundance to open the pathways to infinite expression. Wow, I, <laughs> that blew my mind. I, uh, I got very, very excited because I mentioned that I, I paint, I've been painting abstract art for a while and seeing, just seeing this, right? You're creating these virtual reality, super immersive galleries, right? Um, I, I see so much potential, right? With, with this for digital art, artists of all like music, right? Um, what, what got you to, to launch this in the first place? <laughs> It's pretty new. We actually opened uh, in early April. I uh, came up with the idea in March, uh, and we've been live. And we, I've uh, got four four of us as co-founders, um, and got a network of developers and and artists and and people involved. We've already hosted major artists like Imogen Heap, who is a multi Grammy winner. Greg Spiro, who's an incredible jazz pianist, who toured with Halsey uh, for four years, mentor with Herbie Hancock. We have. Um, acts coming out of Korea, an artist tonight, actually. Well, I should say, uh, it will, by the time this is filmed, uh, tonight after recording this interview, we have uh, the first ever song written and produced by AI out of Korea that's performed live by a Korean K-pop star in VR. Uh, so we've been, we've been bringing communities together, music, arts, sports. And what inspired me was this realization of, you know, it's an amalgamation of, uh, of all the things I've done in my life as a musician, as a dad, as an entrepreneur, as, a, as an investor. I've always looked for these moments in markets where things are about to change dramatically. And as I've, you know, developed my career, I've been able to be at the helm of them more and more, right? Starting Bitco, literally launched Bitco right after Mt. Gox collapsed and everybody's saying Bitcoin's dead. It's not secure. So we launched the security brand for Bitcoin, raised 12 million in a couple of weeks, brought in great investors and brought the company to market. Um, you know, in the, in the gaming days, I saw the opportunity in social gaming, mobile gaming, casino, social casino, uh, cloud gaming. So I always am, got my ear. Part of my strategy as, a, as an advisor, an LP, as an investor is to really find the people who are pushing the envelope and then think about how can I support, institutionalize that. In this case, with the NFT, obviously there's a lot of NFT movements and there's so much energy on Clubhouse right now. If you go to Clubhouse, there's all these NFT rooms and people are spending hours upon hours sharing tips. But what are they doing? They're talking to each other, no, vid no visuals, just voice. It's like a ham radio network, you know? And then when there's a drop, an NFT drop, people are selling something, well, there's a website that goes along with it. I mean, it feels like something off of eBay, like a very flat website. You're a painter, right? I'm a musician. Does that, really, does that really represent the value of what we're doing? And so then you have big items like Beeple selling a JPEG for $69 million. Why is a JPEG worth $69 million? You go back to the story. He created 5,000 consecutive days of visual art and for the first time launched all of those in one as an NFT. 
So that's historic. There's something historic happening there. When Justin Blau launched his, sold his albums for $11.7 million as an NFT, there was something historic happening there. So I think we're on the precipice of historical change. And the best way to understand that change is if you can immerse yourself in it within a community that's connected directly to the artist. And uh, because last year I had um, partnered with someone to help bring Burning Man to VR, we found this platform, it's called Altspace, hosted by Microsoft. And it's a great platform to build on. Uh, we built Burning Man in VR. We had the, the community build 200 virtual worlds in a matter of a month. And so I saw this technological opportunity to harness the potential energy of the community and then give them the room to run and innovate. And so it was, it was apparent to me to launch something. I found some great collaborators, launched the NFT Oasis, and now we're up and running and scaling very quickly. That's incredible. I, I love the vision and I can see a lot of potential and um, I, I hope to be one of the <laughs> one of the users on your platform one day to uh, to get on there with, with the art. Um, the, I think the, the key the key the key thing is that it's a it's it is a tokenization it's it's a it's a crypto project it's a t it's a blockchain project that the we are launching a social token for a digital gig economy. People who have been furloughed from the hospitality and the entertainment industry can come and work, hang art, be videographers you know, be moderators and people who build history and build up these various worlds and communities can accrue value in virtual real estate. So this is a cultural creator centric real estate play that's empowered by DeFi. And that is, I think, really beyond what anything is happening in the ecosystem right now. Um, but it's exactly the future I want to see. Well, I, I just want to kind of, I, I always think videos are, are more fun to watch than talking about it. Um, so I'm going to share one more video. Imogen Heap, who's an incredible multi-Grammy winning artist, came and performed live in the NFT Oasis. We built out the Imogen Heap world. Hundreds of people attended her concert in VR and she was streaming in from the UK, larger than life on a stage that we built for her. I think sharing, showing a little of this video will give people inspire imagination of where we're headed. <laughs> immersive and incredible and I, I'm excited to see how how this all takes off here with NFT Oasis. I see so much potential and I, I couldn't have think in any anyone other than you to, to lead this uh, venture but this revolution as well. Um, Will before we, we close out today's conversation I want to, wanted to take it just back to, to sort of entrepreneurship at the broadest level. You're obviously a very accomplished entrepreneur and investor. You know a lot about this space about the journey. Um, what actionable advice would you give to entrepreneurs who who truly want to make an impact, who want to change the world in some way, shape, or form? Well, I, I think I, I, I'll provide a couple of different angles on that. You know, first of all, take care of yourself. Take care of your your mental health, your stress, um, your family. You know, if you have a really, if you're taking care of yourself, you're exercising, you're meditating. You are, you know, you have a good family home. You're having dinner with your family, you know, not missing it. Um, 
I won't talk about whether he gets sleep or not. It's a different topic, but, <laughs> but, it, but, it, but do the other things so that you're a center because entrepreneurship, it's like one day you're flying high and the next day you're crashing down and nothing has changed. Absolutely no data has changed, but for some reason you feel amazing and you feel like garbage the next day. So I think that's really important. Uh, the second piece of advice is I would always look for mentors. I would look for people who can be really, really specific mentors in particular areas and find a way to have a regular cadence of communication with them. Um, I think that finding somebody who can be a mentor and just getting into a regular pattern of like updating them asynchronously, you know, hit them up on text or telegram, just say, here's something I'm doing. You'll find that the best mentors out there will will pick up intuitively when it's time to step in and help or have a call rather than saying, can we have a call every week or can we meet every week? I mean, it's exhausting to do that, right? Most people um, have a lot of things going on. So be, be proactive, be clear, be cogent in your communication with mentors. Um, and then I think thirdly is, uh, you know, going back to the kind of the 550, 500, that's one scale concept, right? But it is another scale concept I use is radical prioritization. Like what are the two or three things that I'm working on? And does everything else in the company fall under one of those, one of those branches? If it doesn't, then somebody's off the reservation going and doing something that is not really part of the mission. Um, and it's great to reward innovation, but not everybody can be doing that at all times. So the more as a leader that you can communicate, this is what's important to me. As new data comes in, I'm going to revise this. Here's how I'm going to communicate with the team of what we're doing. And here's who needs to be informed. Here's who needs to, you know, actually be responsible for something. So if you can build that organizational infrastructure in your company, um, it's actually more important than culture, to be honest. Culture is honestly sometimes a crutch uh, that when people haven't figured out how to organize themselves. Um, and then lastly, I would say in this day and age, look at unconventional ways to grow a company. You know, you can have a global workforce through open source technologies. You can hire wherever you want. They don't have to be in the same office. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of different approaches to building teams and to building and to, and to building companies. But it's really important if you're going to be successful as a CEO, uh, your job is to set strategy. It is to hire amazing people and it's to not run out of money. And if you do those three things, then you'll be successful. I love it. That, that's uh, excellent advice and wisdom uh, for all the founders uh, who are tuned into this special conversation. Will, thank you so much for giving us some of your time. Again, I know you're incredibly busy. You're just working on so many incredible projects. Thank you for, for coming here, sharing your time with us. And we can't wait to see you uh, just really keep innovating as you go on these big frontiers with technology. Thank you for being here. Bye. Thank you very much. I want to say best of luck to all the founders out there, to all the investors. Be nice to the founders. And, you know, I'm glad that Armando, you and your team are, are helping all of these companies, all these projects take flight. It's very important for our world that we continue to further embrace innovation.